Many a times we have an emergency call from a client which requests immediate action by performing a forensic analysis on a computer system in the company due to a user possibly roaming outside the authorized path. This is all great, but the effectiveness of the investigation is dependent on many attributes we need to consider. We as an organization need to ensure that our systems are ready for an inspection or investigation. For example, there are a few questions that I can pose for you to think about and then ponder on your forensic re readiness stance. This is of your organization. One, can I prove that the user ID that committed an offense is tied to one single user? If a user ID is shared among staff, then how can I prove who was the offending party? Yes, it may be possible to determine if there are shifts being worked and there is a trustworthy physical access control system. This is not always the case and can only weaken the primary evidence. Also, second question, could a disgruntled administrator of the system have planted the evidence? Also, do you monitor all logon attempts at the workstation and the server level in your environment? Let's have a look at the security event log settings on a Microsoft Windows and how we can use this possibly to assist in generating trustworthy evidence. But before we look at that, make sure that you understand that the workstation or server time should be controlled accurately in your domain. For example, your time server should obtain its value from a reputable time server on the internet and have all other workstations and server obtain its time setting from your trusted domain server. For any additional information, refer to NTP or Network Time Protocol. Let's have a look then at the possible audit settings that we may have. Well, as a first option here, let's look at the security event log settings first. This means how large is the event log and how many events we can add to that. This all depends on the size of the event log. Then also what we can do is the retention. You know, do we actually log only for seven days? Do we manually have to clear the event log? And then also there's another option that we can say is to overwrite the events. Let's go to manage computer. And under this you'll see the event viewer. And in this example, you can see my application log is already at two meg, security log at 128K and 384K. By default, the event log size is about 512K. But what we do, which I've done here already and I'll show you in the example, under properties, I define my event log here as about 16 meg. It can go up to um, a Microsoft, uh, I think it's about two gigs in total before it actually um, gets a limitation. Um, but what we found is that the larger the event log is, the more memory is being utilized during the event process and may impact performance. Also, normally on a system we define overwrite events as needed. If you don't do this and you have, say, things like um, overwrite events older than seven days and the event log fills up too quickly, an application might stop and come back with an error message that the event log is full. Also, do not overwrite events. We need to clear that manually. If you define this, make sure that you have a process in place to actually handle this. Also, do this with the application security event log, overwrite events as needed. Now, once again, it also depends on the security setting or requirement of the server. For example, if it's got a confidentiality of, say, secret, you might say, do not overwrite events, set it high and clear manually. In the registry, you, you may then also say, stop the server as soon as the event log is, is full. This is for high risk, um, say for example, huge money transfers, you need access, who logs on and off to the server, you need to keep a permanent history of that. Um, could be a solvents oxy requirement that you want to keep all accesses, logons and logoffs to that server from all users. Now once we've said that, we're quite happy, but the next step is actually to determine all the events that need to be audited and writ written to the event log. We do that under 
the administrative tools, and then the local security policy. In the local security policy, there's a section called local policy, audit policy, and by default, under Windows 2003, this is what we've got. All system events, there is success and failure. There's nothing audited by default. Let's actually select failures, process tracking failures, privilege use failures. Now, what we, why we're doing that is that if we don't do any auditing, at least, at least all the exceptions, gather that and write that to the event log. Policy change, this is when, what I'm doing now, I'm performing a policy change. So all success and all failures, we want to audit that. Object access, this is a very difficult one. Only if you do debugging, then select success. Success of objects, especially if the server is really busy, will fill up the event log with information that is not necessarily advantageous for any security review. So a, an event log, we've seen event logs that's quite large and actually filled up and overwritten within a day in some organizations. You can actually define failure here as well. Log on event success and failure. Directory services, we don't have directory services in here, we're not going to audit. Account management, this is when accounts are created, deleted, password changes are taking place, and then also account log on events. Now as you can see here, the success and the failure of the event account logon events, normal system logon events, we've seen that, and then account management, success and failure, and then policy change. These four items, policy change, audit logon events, account management, and audit account logon events, have to be set to success and failure to have some information that is worthwhile. Many times I see that often a setting will only allow for an account logon event to be on failure, as the default says. The problem I have with that is that if we have a hacking attempt and a user tries to log on with a privileged user ID and the failures get logged, your security settings aren't adequate where it locks out that account who says that the user didn't successfully guess the password? You have four or five failed attempts and then there's no logging on the success. You would like to know that to see where this takes place. So that logging should be on. Now, you need to also consider the example here is purely on a local security policy. Within a domain, consider defining the domain controller policy in your security policy of the GPO or group policy objects and then also also consider creating different OUs or, or organizational units where different security event logging takes place for example high risk medium risk and low risk in the high risk we might um, also enable process tracking whereby we want to know when an application is started and write that to the event log. Then after having those three different categories, what we can do is then define the classification of the servers and add them to each OU. So each server will be managed accordingly. Now that is really simple and a very quick implementation. It is actually shocking to see how many deployments out there have incorrect settings. You should implement this both at the workstation and at the server level, of course, with adequate standards, procedures, guidelines, and approved policies as your framework to support this initiative.